When my mom died, I was 29. She had just turned 50. It was earth shattering, but not for predictable reasons. At the time, we lived more than 2,000 miles apart and only had a few strained, obligatory conversations each month. Still, I sobbed uncontrollably. It wasn't just the immediate shock of loss and unspoken goodbyes. I missed what would have been. I thought one day, me and my mom would become friends. I looked forward to showing her that I was capable, successful, and well-adjusted. I wanted to make her proud, and I probably wanted to rub her nose in it a little bit. I thought age was the key to unlocking our pent-up, unconditional love for each other that was living behind a wall of passive aggression. I cried because I'd never get to tell her that she was kind of a jerk when I was a kid and laugh with her about it. My mom had a great sense of humor, but we rarely shared laughs together. At family gatherings, she was a boisterous comedian, commanding attention at high volume. I'd see a side of her that I never knew at home. She was gregarious, her voice would go up an octave, and she'd talk with her hands. There was a big smile as she spoke. It was like a magic trick, this transformation. She could be the life of the party, but if you ask me to describe our ha a childhood home, the most striking characteristic was the silence. I wonder if it was a reaction to the chaotic home my mom must have grown up in. She had five siblings. Their mother, my grandmother, Aggie, died when my mom was 13. My mom wasn't the oldest, but she was the most responsible, so she assumed an adult role at an early age as was the custom in rural Louisiana. They lived with my great-grandparents in St. Joe, the state's smallest and poorest township. I imagine that when she moved to Las Vegas, after finishing high school, that she felt free for the first time. Las Vegas was home to many black families from the South because of the abundance of service industry jobs. Her older brother, my Uncle Willie, and his wife had moved there a few years earlier when he finished military service. All of the siblings followed. Moving to the big city with her own apartment, making her own money, and deciding her own life must have been a dream come true for my mom. She was working at a casino, doing housekeeping, and sometimes serving cocktails. She was taking a clerical course. She had a boyfriend, and then she had me. I don't know my biological father. My mother never even told me his name, and something in me knew never to ask. When I was four, my mom sent me to live with my great-grandparents in Louisiana, the same ones who raised her. She needed help, and that was a time when childcare wasn't readily av available for single working women. I lived with my great-grandparents for one fabulous year in which I knew what it was like to be a rock star. My grandpa took me with him everywhere, and all the adults laughed and joked about how sedity I sounded and acted. Sedity being a rural rebuke of city life and mannerisms. After a year, I returned home to Las Vegas and met my mom's new friend. He was a giant at six foot six inches. He had a huge smile and kind eyes, and I liked him right away. They explained that he was something called a husband, and he would be living with us. <laughs> My mom had a new last name, and so did I. We soon moved into a modest three-bedroom house, and I embarked on the life of a pretty regular 70s West Coast latchkey kid. It wasn't until much later that I realized how foreign and highly irregular my life was compared to my mom's upbringing in the segregated South. The school I walked to for the first six years of elementary was four city blocks from my house, not miles away through southern unplaved roads. I never wore hand-me-downs. I never killed a chicken or cleaned chitlins for dinner. I never prepared a full meal for a family of eight or even our family of three. I had my own room painted inspirational yellow, my own double bed and my own floral sheets and bedspread. 
I had my own bathroom, and I had never used an outhouse. There was a TV in my room and a phone. There was a modest front and backyard that did not reek of livestock. When I whined about filling the dishwasher after not contributing any labor to actually making the meal or moaned about eating okra, yuck, or having pork chops again, boring, or dusting the glass shelves in the living room, isn't this futile? We live in a desert. <laughs> it's a wonder she didn't just lock me out of the house and return to the couch as I whimpered in the yard. I don't know that my mom and I would have been the best of friends, but I did look forward to showing her that I was worth the sacrifices she made to raise me. We were dispassionately, contentedly mother and daughter most of my life, bound together by fate, but as familiar as strangers on a reality television program in which the contestants are not allowed to leave the house. I was a kid, so I didn't know about ulterior motives or psychological withholding, but I knew I was supposed to love my mom with all my heart, no matter what, and I did. I think she signed the same agreement for her part, but she knew there was a love loophole that meant she didn't have to like me. She knew that meeting the needs of your small human could be a proxy for love. I mean, what is love anyway? I was surely as curious a being to her as an alien, and based on her upbringing in Louisiana, in a town in which every black family received their last names from wealthy white families who held hostage and abused their ancestors, I was an alien. At the age of eight, I asked her to buy me a notebook so that I could write poetry thoughts when they came to me. She probably rolled her eyes. But she got me a small notebook to carry around. One night, I was dreamier than usual, staring transfixed out the back window of the car as we drove home. My mom pretended not to notice. She could be really stoic. And she was so unenamored by my kookier artistic behavior that she actively refused to comment on it. She got out of the passenger side and left the door open. But I stayed in the back seat scribbling and erasing. When I finally walked into the kitchen, curiosity got the best of her. What was that about? I was writing a poem, I said en route to grab a snack. What did you write? I imagined my eight-year-old self pausing with a cookie near my open mouth, wrinkling my face in confusion. My mom didn't ask me about what I wrote. She didn't ask me how school was or what I learned today. She didn't want to know about what I was drawing or building. She didn't take an interest in kid stuff. She wasn't good at faking it. So when she asked about my poem, I hesitated, but decided, OK, I'll play along. This is the only poem I remember from that period in my life. And I'm sure it's because of this moment. <clears throat> Though the moon is high and I am low, it seems to follow wherever I go. As I finished, there was the faintest reaction, a flicker of emotions so quick I couldn't decipher them. Then she covered all traces with her practiced, disinterested mom mask. That it, she asked. Um, I don't know yet. It was another question I was unprepared for. Then she just walked away. That was mom. Never mommy or mama, mom. My earliest memories are of her talking to me as simply and matter-of-factly as I'm talking to you right now. My mom didn't believe in baby talk. There was no babas or binkies, no going wee-wee or sleepy time. As a result, I grew up speaking in complete sentences and my phone voice, phone vo phone, <laughs> phone voice <laughs> was always confused for hers, even by my aunts and uncles. Yes, I talked exactly like this as a 10-year-old. 
when unfamiliar adults would lean down to converse with me, mimicking childlike voices, it always creeped me out. <laughs> what do you want to be when you grow up and become a big girl? Um, I plan to become a psychiatrist and help people. <laughs> I meant it. I came to that career decision when I was five years old, and I didn't change my mind until college. I think I wanted to know what made people think, people tick. People like my mom. I never saw my mom cry, and I can count the number of times that she said she loved me out loud on one hand. I remember them because they were so jarring. Like when a random stranger who looks like they might punch you walks up and says, your brown eyes are pretty. Or you look like a movie star. My mom did her motherly duty, but she didn't really seem to enjoy it most of the times. She wasn't overly strict or overly stern or overly anything. She was indifferent, mostly. I had breakfast, lunch, and dinner, usually home-cooked and delicious, but she, uh, um, but, uh, hmm, but often spent evenings in separate rooms watching different televisions. She was smart and beautiful and had big dreams, I think. She never told me about them, but I saw the longing for them in her eyes. And I imagine that was the reason. I was a pretty quiet kid who was perfectly happy dreaming up stories and talking quietly to imaginary friends. I've always been happier with pen and paper than with company. Our quiet house was a haven to me. She must have wondered intensely about what in the world was going on in that brain of mine. Honestly, I didn't think she cared until the day she read my journals. I knew because she decided to ask me about a few passages she disliked. I never suspected that was something another person would do, trans trespass on your private thoughts. I didn't know shame and fury until that moment. She broke my heart, but I didn't scream and yell about it. That was not our way of communicating. The next day, while she was at work, I quietly burned every journal and everything I had ever written in the fireplace. Never been able to pick up the habit of writing in a journal again. Years later, when I was in high school, my mom asked if I would call us friends. She wanted to know if I'd feel comfortable confiding in her if I had a problem. I'm sure she did not remember the journal incident. The question was out of the blue, but it must have been on her mind for a while. I took too long to answer. Uh, sure, <sighs> yeah, of course. <laughs> but we both knew that meant no. Neither of us knew how to fix it, and I assumed that time was the answer. Fate, however, did not communicate. I turned 50 last year the same age my mom will forever be. It felt eerie and sad and heavy with expectation. Even though our lives were so divergent, outliving my mother holds an odd significance, significance I haven't yet reconciled. When she died, I helped my dad go through her belongings. We found a time capsule of items I didn't anticipate. She never praised me on my grades or test scores. She often said I was book smart, but common sense dumb. So I hadn't expected the folder holding every report card and teacher's note I'd ever had from school, including my Bachelor of Rhymes <laughs> kindergarten <laughs> diploma. <laughs> from my year in Louisiana. I found crayon assignments, my infant footprints, handmade cards, postcards I'd sent from Hungary, Spain, and dozens of little treasures I would not have thought her sentimental enough to keep. The most surprising thing I found, though, was her poetry. I never knew she wrote. There weren't many, just a handful written on wide-ruled, loose-leaf paper in her practiced penmanship. All the pieces were neatly filed in an unlabeled manila folder. Who knows how long they resided there. The ending of a poem titled Achieve caught my attention. My body you may capture, 
No matter what it takes, my thoughts escape. My mom had been sick for a while, and I wonder if that meant she'd been coping by creating stories. Something I would have done. Another piece entitled Victory was about overcoming past mistakes. It was vague, but in it, she seemed to be giving herself a pep talk, telling herself that it was not too late to accomplish some goal. But the poem that caused my hands to shake as I read it was titled Motherless Child. Lonely and confused I wander. What will become of me? In it, she asked a series of sincere and pained questions without answers. The collection of items gave me an odd validation and comfort. My mother loved me as best as she could. She was human and flawed and yet created a life of relative ease for me that was foreign for her. That is no small feat and I don't begrudge her any mistakes. I can't imagine the plight of a motherless child raising a child who is an alien. <laughs> I wish I could tell her I appreciate her, I appreciate her for doing her best. And I wish I could say, yes, mom, I would call us friends. The indelible Deborah Bass, everyone. <laughs>